Welcome to the Outhouse Lounge, where we relax and talk about sh- stuff. I'm Chris Cordani, your host. Quite often, this show has been referred to as old guys or old folks. Let's uh, let's let's make it uh, gender equal there. Trying to remember stuff, perhaps it is. Taking that into consideration, joining me in the lounge is somebody who might be able to fix me here. She's an actress known for playing opposite the likes of O.J. Simpson, several other cool people, a mom to rapper kid, and daughter of one of my favorite comedians, Red Fox. Well, played the daughter of Red Fox. She wasn't the daughter of Red Fox. Let me make sure that happens. She was also she also portrayed a rather prophetic 1990 movies tennis coach. She's also a famed age disruptor. Again, somebody I'd love to have on just because of that. She's done TED Talks and coaches people on the concept of shameless aging. Marianne Alda, welcome to the Outhouse Lounge. Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me. And one clarification. I play ki- Rapper Kid's mom. I, I'm not Rapper Kid's right, mom. Right, right. See, I but... have to clarify that. I, I said you played it. I went down the list, and it's like, well, I, oh, yeah. No, I, have to, I, I said you played. Th- That's right. So you played Rapper Kid's mom. Right. And in a movie right. called Class Act, and um, and Meshack Taylor was my husband. And he was also, I also played his girlfriend on Designing Women. So it, it's funny because I ran into his wife, um, Bianca Ferguson, who my background is soap operas. Her background is soap operas. I was on Edge of Night when she was on um, General Hospital. And I ran into her at an audition one day and she said, girl, you in bed with my husband more than I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Let's jump into that. I want to get into your shameless aging because I, I've I've never met I've, I've had the two separately, shameless and aging, but I've never been able to put them together. You're going to help me with that later on. But first, I do want to get into that because you mentioned Edge of Night. Dee Dee, your character, was rather groundbreaking because there weren't a lot of uh, a lot of black or African American actors or actresses in soap operas. Right, and a lot of the uh, the storylines were. You know, they were like, round the way girls, you know, they were <clears throat> from the wrong side of the tracks, blah, blah, blah. And I came along and I played an attorney. Um, and it was 1981 when I started on that show. And uh, I was the distaff half of Calvin and Dee, Dee which was one of the first, you know, black soap opera super couples along with Angie and Jesse and all my children and Ed and Carla on One Life to Live. And it 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 was interesting because I didn't realize that that character meant so much to so many people till it started airing and I was I was it was one Sunday I was it had gone to church at Lincoln Center I had gone to Alice Tully Hall the little coffee shop across the street I walked into the coffee shop I saw uh, an older black woman probably she's the age I am now anyway she was sitting in the <laughs> back of the coffee shop and I, she nodded and I nodded and then I sat down and I was facing the door so when she was leaving she was going towards towards the door and she had to turn around to face me she turned around and faced me she cupped my chin in her hand and she said oh baby it's so good to see you on that show and so I that I got goosebumps and I realized that 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 character meant a lot to a lot of people, especially, uh, well, I think the younger generation too, but especially the older generation who had been through so much and to see a character like Dee Dee on Edge of Night was really meaningful to them. So I wanted to make sure that I always um, played her with honor and dignity. Oh, that's a good thing. And again, I never watched soap operas that much when I was younger. My mother used to watch her stories when I was uh, growing up. So it was always All My Children, General Hospital, and that other one that was, it. was that Another World? One Life another to world. Live. One Life, one to, life live. to Live. And the ABC right. soaps, right. right. And then we were on after, um, oh, what was the one with the vampire? Um, oh, Dark, sh- wait, Dark, Dark Shadows. Dark Shadows. Okay. Yeah. Dark Shadows, and that was a half hour show, and and then Edge of Night was a half hour show, and we came on, I think, after Dark Shadows, before Mickey Mouse Club. I'm trying to get it right. <laughs> there you go. Well, the, there you go. Mickey Mouse Club, Dark Shadows, and Edge of Night. That that's uh, now in New York. It was General Hospital, then Edge of Night. 
Mm. I think that's what it was, if I'm correct here. Um, okay. So my mother started watching that. And again, it's we. this is uh, 81, okay? You're talking mm -hmm. about 10, 15 years after there were a lot of uh, major African-American characters in comedies, in, in dramas, movies, everything else. Soap operas were kind of a final frontier. I know we don't have all the answers, but I'd like, like to ask you as somebody who is in the industry, why do you think that is? I really don't know. I think maybe it was because of the, the perception was that daytime audiences were more uh, homogeneous, homogeneous, homogeneous. <laughs> the, something uh, like that yeah something like that <laughs> i know one is for milk that's homogenized and i know that's not the word but anyway it could be the same thing i guess right <laughs> yeah i guess well you have you do have chocolate milk now I have um, homogenized music now so <laughs> <laughs> um I, I really don't know you'd have to ask somebody at the, at the uh at the networks of the studios but i do remember in the late 70s I was a member of the Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA. They were two separate unions before they merged. And AFTRA was the domain of soap operas. And I, I think it was like 70s, 8, 79, um, the conventional wisdom was that Black actors, while trained in the theater, were not trained in, uh, in television. And that they were, their performances would be too big, too broad. And so AFTRA did a lottery and they just matched. They had 10 couples, 10 men, 10 women. They put us together for to do scenes. And each was assigned a director from one of the soaps, which back at that time, during the, that time, there were 11 soap operas in New York. Like Secret Storm, Love of Life. I mean, there were just a ton of soap operas. And, and so I, I want to I <clears throat> disrupt that. I want to disrupt for a second. Yeah, okay. disrupt because we're going to do your age disrupting thing. We're talking about soap operas. Comedy television shows have been around for uh, all these years. So there's so of uh, dramas and things like that. Mm -hmm. You've had soap operas that have dated back to the radio days. So right. we're talking about 70 plus years of a full genre that hasn't, that had not invited. Um, a major um, African American character like yours, and that, that's that's what I found interesting. Well, you know, and um, Agnes Nixon was the one who really, she, with One Life to Live and All My Children, she brought in the characters of uh, Carla. She started off as Carla Benari. We thought she was a white actress, and she actually was playing an actress. Uh, and then we found out that uh, Sadie was her mother and that she was actually biracial. And so that was a really um, provocative storyline for that was back in the seventies. And I was in college at the time and I, I was watching that and I watching that storyline made me believe that I could be uh, on television and I, and I wanted to be on a soap opera. And, you know, I, I, when I do motivational speaking to young people, I tell them, you know, dream big, but sometimes you have to see it to believe it. If you can't create it in your imagination, you need some something outside of yourself that you can look at and stimulate your imagination to make you think, uh, you know, to make you believe that you can have. So that's why I think it's, it's, diversity, equity, and inclusion is so important and why I am now, you know, back in the, the 70s, 80s, I was very much an advocate for uh, diversity for people of color, for ethnic diversity. Now I'm advocating for age diversity. There we go. You yeah. know, because in the, you know, in the, the rainbow, diversity rainbow, gray is often excluded. So, um, so yeah, I think that that's, that's really important because again, it's, you know, Becca Levy has a book out, um, and she did a study at Yale university and people who have a positive image of getting older live on average seven and a half years longer than people with a negative image about getting older. So it's, it's ruining our lives. 
you know, it's killing us basically when we see the these images on uh, negative images on TV, and and it just, ooh, oh, it oh, just that, fries wanna, my gourd. <laughs> I want to jump into that one. Have you ever okay. seen those Medicaid Martha commercials? The ones where that old lady is sitting with a huge glasses. I'm not even sure if she's really an elderly woman, but she has these. Some, I thought she was some young girl made up to look like one because she has these squint. She they they per, she purposely scrunches her eyes. Has these huge glasses, short hair, bangs on the remote, and gets grouchy at the narrator, going, "I'm not calling. I I the Medicaid's gonna be. It's all a ripoff. I'm not calling. I, I just had this stubborn act, and I'm thinking, is this what advertising agencies think of people who are 75 and up? That is absolutely horrible because that's not true. There, there are countries, there are cultures in the around the around the world around the world that revere their elderly, that that respect their wisdom. This America and and many of the Western cultures are not them. No, but we're working on it. I think you know the baby boomer generation. We're not aging like our parents, and there are so many of us. And now Gen X are getting into middle age. My son is Gen X and he'll be 50 in January. And so now, and the baby boomers are living longer. And so now there are a lot more people coming into this demographic of over 50 and we cannot be ignored. Um, during the pandemic, I was very much on the audio app clubhouse and there were two ca categories I'd go into, the older women and then the new Hollywood rooms. And every time I would go into the new Hollywood rooms, I would tell these, the young writer, directors, producers, you know, when you do not write a nuanced, um, complicated, interesting, vital, vibrant, older woman in your, in your um, scripts, you're leaving money on the table. Because if you build it, if you write it, we will come. If you write it, we will watch. And if you write it and we watch it and you advertise it, we'll buy your products. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I have something. You probably worked with, and again, I was a big fan of Red Foxes. You worked with two of the two of the greatest older actors. I mean, they had great careers throughout their lives, but two of the greatest older actors who I would consider maybe age disruptors before you were an age disruptor in, in, in a different way, because you're actually teaching other people how to do it. But, uh, Della Reese and Red Fox, you work with them as, uh, as yeah. their daughter in the great comedy Royal family, which unfortunately didn't live as long because, uh, star had a heart attack. Um, yeah. but we'll get into that. Uh, what was it like working with those guys? Because these, these are two legends. Yeah, but you know what? They were legends who had come up the hard way. Right. So they had no attitude. They were, it really was like a family. We really did relate to one or relate to one another like a family. Um, so it was, you know, and Red would sometimes tell the executive producers, listen, I've, I've been, I'm a star already. Give some of these children. And he included me <laughs> as one of the children. Give some of these children some of the lines. Make them stars. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, he was very <laughs> gracious and generous that way. And Della was also a, a, a minister, um, a metaphysical minister. I Kind of so like that's you, how, you so that's how they got to make her the boss angel. I get that. So when <laughs> when she went to heaven, she became the boss angel. Now I understand why. Right. Well, it was certainly typecasting, and she used to have. Um, I wouldn't say Bible study. I would say uh, spiritual classes in her dressing room. You know, during lunch, and we would go in, and she would. You know, a lot of it was about keeping us grounded and she, anyone could come into the, and you know, not just the cast, but the crew, anyone who wanted to come in and partake and participate was, was more than welcome. And sometimes if there was a uh, tension on the set at all, you know, Della would say, okay, you go over there and I would go over here. We go on opposite ends of the studio when we would meet in the, in the middle. And when she said, we just pray it up, we're going to pray up. Everything's going to be fine today. And we would. We start at the either end. We just, you know, wave our hands and pray and ask God to bless the studio and bless the show. And we'd meet in the middle. And, you know, that's that's um, that's how we roll. 
it's funny because you hear people say you don't want to meet your favorite actors or actresses or anything else like that because you don't want to lose the illusion of all this. You want to like, you want to, you want to know that or you want to think that the people you watch on TV are likable and lovable. And this is what I understand what, uh, how, this is what I understand about Della Reese. People who have talked about her on television or, or written about her have always said they loved her. Um, thoughts? Look, absolutely. I, I was fortunate enough to um, sit with her. She, now, I don't know if she was conscious or not, but they say that your hearing is the last to go. And so I was, and she was, she was at home. She was doing hospice care at home. And I remember sitting by her side and I said, I remember saying to her, I said, now listen, I, when you get up to heaven, I want another series. So will you work on that for me? Cause you know, you got the connections <laughs> and I swear to you, her eyes started going back and forth and she couldn't verbalize it, but in my mind, maybe she was just transmitting it. She said, she was saying, you know how to do this shit. Get it your damn self, you know? So <laughs> I, I don't know if it was my imagination or she was really, uh, you know, telepathically sending me that message, but that was Della. I mean, she was, as much as she was spiritual, she was, she was salty. Oh, she could be salty. Um, and she was just, you know, she was real. And she used to, you know, she was from Detroit. I'm from Chicago. <clears throat> and so we kind of had that Detroit, Chicago badass thing going on. And one day she said to me, I don't know what prompted her to say it, but she looked at me one day and she said, you know what? I, I wouldn't get into a fight with you in a brown paper bag. I have no <laughs> idea what that meant, but I took it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. So, so Marianne, did that actually work? You got the new series right after that. <laughs> <clears throat> and I think what you meant by that is, you know, that I am tenacious and I don't take, I don't take no for an answer. So I think that's what she meant, you know, that, and, and with that, and she was, I think maybe she saw a bit of herself in me. I think that's true, I would say, because we had a good relationship. I loved her. I, I want to get to your age disruptor thing, but I, I, yes. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you if you had a cool Red Fox story for us. Oh, I've got a few. <laughs> well, I'm in. Um, okay. <laughs> um, when I first, my first meeting with Red Fox, I had already been cast in the show, um, but I had not met the other members of the cast. And so our first meeting was for a photo shoot at the CBS studios. And they, I got a call, you know, they're going to have hair and makeup, but they asked if we would bring some of our own wardrobe because they hadn't fitted us and, and, you know, they had our sizes. So they had a few things, but they said, bring some of your own wardrobe. And I, back in the eighties, Laura Ashley, those kind of flowy little house on the prairie looking dresses that had really no shape to them. They're just kind of long and flowy. Anyway, <laughs> wardrobe put me in that dress, and oh, then goody. we and then we went out for this on the set, and Red looked at me and he said to wardrobe, "Can't we get her something else to wear?" <laughs> and I said, "Red, this is my dress," and he said, "Well then, damn, let's take up a collection and buy this child some clothes." <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "He said, look." You got a nice shape. Nobody can see it. This is show business, baby. You got to show them something. And he made them go get some pins and pin up the back of the dress. And he looked at it. He said, now that's better. And then he looked at my bosoms and he said, and can we get her some socks or something? You know, you, we got, the, we got the, the daughter over the teenage daughter who's got a bigger chest than the mama. That's not right. And they got <laughs> socks and they, you know, put, they put socks in my stuff my bra with socks and <clears throat> so they uh whenever we would have tape days i had special bras you know push-up padded bras and i remember we were having a rehearsal one day and red said where's your chest <laughs> i said oh, boy. it's in wardrobe he said 
No, nah, no, nah, baby, I got to watch. I got to look at you all the time. It's only $1,500. I can buy you some. <laughs> and so I mean, he just, just teased me. So what I did was I went to the scenic department and then I had them build up like a 44 quadruple D fake chest. They painted it the right color. I went to wardrobe. They gave me a big breakaway blouse. <clears throat> and one day, uh, Red was was having some health issues. So back in the day when there were four camera sets, multi-cams, and we would shoot everything on a sound stage, we would do two audiences on a Friday night be, and tape two, or have a come in, show come in at six and then maybe at eight. And or maybe five and whatever. That's not important. The important thing is that we had gotten into the habit of the routine of taping our dress rehearsal the day before and then just doing one show on Friday night in front of a live audience. <clears throat> so it was tape day. The cameras are rolling. Red is sitting in Grandpa's chair, which is the back, the, the door is behind, front door is behind him. And Della's character is supposed to be coming in with a bag of groceries. And she yells through the door, Al, because his name was Al, the character's name was Al, Al, come help me with these groceries. And he gets up out of the chair and turns around and instead, I come through the door with this big chest and then a breakaway blouse. <laughs> and, just, and Della said, he, he, he was like, you know, and like in Sanford and Son, he would just go like this. And my character's name was Elizabeth. He would uh -oh. go like, oh, oh, he, and he couldn't say anything. And Della said, she got you good, didn't she, Red? She you can't <laughs> say anything. You're going to leave her alone now because she got you good. And um, actually, the very next week is when he had his fatal heart attack on the mm. set. And I thought, oh, my flashing him was maybe too much for him. So I, I guess he like was him. upset he wasn't uh, abreast of the situation. <laughs> Mm. That was a bad joke, Chris, but we'll we'll let it slide. It, it was pretty horrible, but I'm, I'm known for my bad jokes, so it's good. Okay. Yeah, that's why I'm not on television. That's why I wasn't <laughs> in the royal family like you were, okay? So. <laughs> you might you might have fit right in. Hey, I'm, 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 I'm pretty darn cute, I guess, you know? <laughs> uh, Marianne Alda is with me on the Outhouse Lounge. We want to talk about this because... You are something of an age disruptor. That's your new business. That's 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 how you reinvented yourself. Now you are back in acting. You are doing stand up. We're going to get into that again. But I I have age knocked down. I have the shameless part uh, kind of down pat. But the aging shamelessly thing, I need some help. So well, can you help me out a little bit? Sure, I can do that. Um, when I hit my in early 50s, the casting directors just stopped calling me. <clears throat> and I had a great run, a great good 30-year uh, career in television. Well, that's, you know, all I did. I just acted and that paid my bills. And suddenly they stopped calling me. And then I realized that a lot, a lot of my career, I had been the appendage to a man. I played a lot of wives, a lot of girlfriends. Um, you know, the, the pretty girl. And what do you the, do with the pretty girl when she gets old? Hollywood doesn't know what to do with her. My, my agent at the time suggested that I gain 50 pounds so that I could do more character work. Hold on a second. You normally agents tell their female actresses to lose weight. Oh, you're two pounds overweight. You got to do some more push. They told, he, he told you to, I want to stop. He told you to gain 50 pounds. That's, so he's telling you to be unhealthy at this point. Well, but keep in mind, there, there was, when it comes to Black actresses, Black actresses of color, mature Black women, there, he was suggesting that I go for the big mama roles. Mm. Um, we have Tyler Perry for that now. Well, yeah, most, most, and most of the big mamas were played, the successful big mamas were played by men, Tyler Perry and uh, Martin Lawrence. Uh, and I thought, no, I, 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 that's, that's not me. Right. I'm, I, high blood pressure and diabetes runs in my family. I wasn't going to ruin my health. And also I am adverse to playing any kind of stereotype and I want to 
change the negative stereotypes. So I thought, well, <clears throat> I'll just go back to the stage because I actually started out in theater in New York. And, but before that, I mean, I had to make a living. Um, I think actors have a natural curiosity about, about human behavior and motivation. So I spent a year in training to become a hypnotherapist. You can probably learn to hypnotize somebody in a weekend, but to use it therapeutically takes longer. I trained at the Hypnosis Motivation Institute in Tarzana, California. And most of my clients, when I started my residency there, most of my clients were women from that area, from the Tarzano and Sina and Sino area. And they had everything, a lot, very well to do. Um, a lot of them were empty nesters, but they were successful in their careers. They had successful husbands, but they were depressed. And I realized that we as a culture have all have all been hypnotized into believing that women lose value and social and sexual currency with age. And my job was to dehypnotize them and snap them out of that trance. Now, the interesting thing is actors are highly suggestible. So that I was, as I was giving my clients the positive suggestions, they took root in my own subconscious mind and I reclaimed my acting career. And that's when I thought I'm going to go back to the stage. And my very first solo show I did at the auditorium at uh, the Institute. And it was called Snap Out of It. You've Only Been Hypnotized Into Believing You're Over the Hill. And from that, I was on a roll. I did sketch comedy uh, with a trio called Three Black Chicks, Lola Love, Iona Morris, and myself. We did a sketch show called Heratica. Um, and it was about, we just played these sexy, crazy characters. You know, the goddess of love. I played the Stepford wife and Iona's mm -hmm. character was the goddess of sexual freedom, I think. Maybe Lola's sexual freedom and Iona was the goddess of love. Anyway, we were all goddesses. Either way, it all works. Right? <laughs> yeah. And we did. And we did these funny little sketches <clears throat> with little songs and little sketches about getting older. And when I do my stand up, <clears throat> excuse me, when I do my stand up, I, I talk about getting older, but I don't do self deprecating humor. Because the thing about the subconscious mind is it doesn't get the joke. It takes what you say it, at your word and it takes it seriously. So when we say things like, oh, I'm getting old. Oh, I'm so tired. The subconscious mind he hears that. And according to that belief system, you'll behave accordingly. So that's why it is so important for us to do, um, to be careful about what I'll tell you, Della used to say, she had a, a saying, be careful about what you're thinking about when you're not thinking about what you're thinking about. Meaning those little random thoughts of, oh, I'm so tired. Oh, I'm getting old. That you're not thinking about it. But your subconscious mind is hearing every word. So yeah, you have to be course. consciously aware and catch yourself before you, you program your subconscious into making you older than you need to be because you say, Oh, I'm getting old. Your shoe, your shoulders will droop. You'll feel bad about yourself. You just kind of like fall into that behavior. But if you say, um, I, I love myself and whatever age I am, I'm in great, you know, you'll throw your shoulders back. You'll face the world differently. The world will face you differently. And that's important. So you're saying the opposite of the Dr. Smith approach works perfectly. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't do anything. My poor back hurts. Woo! I think I'm a little too old for this. Uh, well, maybe you can do this for me. Yeah. You bubble-headed booby. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's really, really. And, you know, I, I frequently get, I don't know if it's, the way I look, my energy, whatever. When I say that I'm 75, people say, oh, you're not, you're not 75. You're not old. Or if I say I'm old, yeah, I'm old. I don't have a problem with that. Um, it, on the, on the spectrum of young versus old, I'm on that end of the spectrum. 
And I don't have a problem with that. I think we need to take back that word and then just look at it um, non-judgmentally and, and stop uh, projecting all this negative onto it. I'm an older woman. I don't have a problem with that. But I don't fit the stereotype that culturally we see. And that needs to change because I know a lot of older women my age who are just like me. We're just as, you know, fresh and sassy as anybody and else. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't prefer to call myself old either. I prefer to say to these younger people, I'm born at a more comfortable distance from the apocalypse. <laughs> you know, can I use that? I think I you like, should. I think that's a good one. <laughs> I've been, I was born at a more comfortable distance from the apocalypse. Ooh, think that's scary. Perfect. Mm. That's a good yes. comeback. And yeah. at the same time, we can annoy young people by pretending not to be able to hear them. See, that's the good thing about again getting a little older. Oh, no, no, no. I love, you know, I, <laughs> I do not discriminate. You know, age is a both ways. I'm only kidding here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I know. But again, the subconscious mind isn't getting it. Yeah. So I'm, I, I, and I do believe that, that the generations need to work together because the younger generation helps us and ageism, you know, they're helping their future selves, you know, because as age, if they are ageist right now, they're discriminating against their future selves. So they have a vested interest in eliminating ageism as well. It would be nice. Yeah. We, there are too many occupations. I'm in radio, so I'm in the same boat with, uh, with you as an actress. Um, a lot of the producers will think we're too old for things. Uh, radio and TV, it's a, it's a young man's game now. The fact is, though, uh, there are a lot of other businesses, too. It's very hard for people over 50 to find work. That's not a good thing. How do you, how do you help a client who says, uh, Marianne, I've, I've been through this. I have a lot of experience. I have a lot of things to share. I wanna, I've expanded my skill set and everything else. I'm 50-something, 60-something, and still people are... Are, are hesitant to hire me for what I can, what I can bring them. Well, I think, well, first of all, <clears throat> the culture needs to change. That's an absolute, I think corporate America is becoming more socially conscious about that, about, about age discrimination. Um, it definitely falls under the, you know, DEI um, realm. And, See, you I, can I only fall, work on yourself because right, if you I, I, fall into that, I fall into that category where I do not want the government to get involved in anything like that. I don't really, I don't want the government to force somebody to quota me into anything. What I want to do is, uh, I, I, we we should, there should be some kind of mentality change on our end. Like you're helping people right now, you're helping people on our end, the older scale, change our own mentality. We have to do that to help change the mentality of those who are hiring and those who are. Uh, um, right. bring people right. into their, their organizations. Yes. Right. Well, the government doesn't have to get involved, right. but, uh, but corporate America does have a responsibility to its employees and to its workforce and to create a safe working environment where everyone feels welcome and appreciated and that, that and they will get their best work out of them too. And I do believe that, that corporate America is beginning to realize that ageism is not cost effective. It's costing them money to, you know, it's like when somebody's getting, like I always say about acting, just when I'm getting really, really good at it, you're going to kick me out. <laughs> you know, that's how crazy is that? Um, <clears throat> and you practiced all those years too. All those years. I've got my 10,000 hours, probably 20, 30,000. It's funny. Our generations, both I'm an ex and you're a boomer. Our generations have grown up with the work ethic. Okay. And a lot of young people do have a good work ethic, but we do hear about the quiet quitting and the, 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 um, what's that? The, the bare minimum Mondays. I understand that's not the majority of people, but this is something that could trend worse. Maybe having some more older people in, in one's organization will help instill a work ethic and maybe teach some skills to younger people. Just, just a thought, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm off base here. Maybe well, I should no, gain 50 more well, pounds. No, 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 no. Well, I'm going to hold up, hold up here. You know, there's something to be said for bare minimum Mondays and quiet quitting in because maybe that is in response 
to the expectation from corporate America to have fewer people do the same amount of work. Interesting point. And you know, and what they're at, what they're doing is, you know, it's 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 like in Europe, it, and they've been some companies have been experimenting with a four day week. When you have a four day week and you have your your employees have three days off to really relax and rejuvenate, when you come back to the job, you can you're more productive. So, um, do we need a whip and a chair to make people work? Or do can well, we some trust jobs do need those, but that's a different story, I guess. No, no, <laughs> no whip in a chair. No, no, no. Um, uh, but I think it's I think we we have to be socially conscious. And some of these young people have some really pretty good ideas, because, as right. you said, you know, we my generation, you may be Gen X, you know, your generation, too you know, that has that hard work ethic, but has it served us well? Has it served our families? And, you know, there's a lot, so many divorces would, Very because there was the quality of life. That is important too. So I think the two generations have a lot to learn from each other. So I, I, I'm i all for minimum, what is it? Minimum, bare well, minimum Mondays? Yeah. I, 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 like to, I like to hit the ground running on Monday. Monday is the day I like to start getting things done so I can set the tone for the rest of the week. But I understand where you're coming from here. Uh, a better balance between, between one's work and life. You and I, right. we run our own businesses. You were yes. an acting. I suppose you're no stranger to 16 hour days. Oh Plus, no, I always say I am not a nine to five person. I'm a 24 seven person. Right. You know, um, I do the work when it, when it needs to be done because right. when I'm not working as an actor, I'm creating work for myself to get work as an actor. Exactly. So you're always doing something, which, which again is important. And I think when younger people get older, learning that kind of skill, skill set will benefit them as well. So maybe somewhere in between is the answer. Well, you know, there are a lot of young people who are 24 seven people as well you know, that they, they're they doing their gigs and they're doing their, entre, you know, entrepreneur things, they're starting stuff, you know, they're, yeah, they might be on social media, but they're learning how to monetize it. Um, exactly. So I think that that's, that's important. My, I remember having a conversation with my grandson when he was around 11. He's 16 now, <laughs> but he's, and um, he's a real smart kid. I don't just say that. I mean, he's an honors class. He's a smart kid. Excellent. And so, but he was in class and sometimes he wasn't applying himself and performing up to his potential. And, but during the, it was interesting because during the pandemic, when he was left to doing a lot of work on his own, he, it was a whole different thing. And, and it has continued on in high school. So now he's on the honor roll and everything all the time. But he said to me, um, I asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up. And he said, oh, I don't know. And I said, I said, well, do you want to be a teacher? Because his sister at the time wanted to be a teacher. And he said, no, Nana, there's no money in it. I said, really? <laughs> I said, okay. And then he, he said to me, look, Nana, you know, I'm kind of a slacker. And I have to be able to make enough money so that I can afford to do that. So in his mind, you know, what he was calling himself a slacker or maybe that had been projected onto him, by, you know, by his teachers or whatnot, that he was slacking off. He realized that about himself and he realized if I want to run my life the way I want to run my life, that I better make a lot of money. And he's now he's a very entrepreneurial you know conscious kind of guy and when i said when he turned 16 i said oh how does it feel to be 16 he said great now i can get a job nice so, you know <laughs> so he, so i think when we recognize ourselves and what 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 our passion is what drives us because i think too many people are unhappy because they're trying to fit their round peg into a square round hole you know what i'm saying a round peg right. into a square hole no square square peg into a round hole that's or, what they're trying or, to do or better yet, better yet, trying to fit kids haircut <clears throat> into a hat okay yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> we just kind of rest on top i think 
<laughs> yeah, um, I like I like the hair. I like it a lot. It was good stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of going back now, but now they have like little twisties and stuff. Same length, but little twisties and stuff going on. I think that's a new look. But, so um, you, you see the industry improving in its attitude towards older actors and actresses now, in, in as far as acting at television and movies. Slowly but surely, but again, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's from any sense of social consciousness on the part of the studios. I think it's more them responding to the marketplace right. because there are a lot more older people and we want to see what we want to see. Um, you know, some of the some of the big block must buster movies that were aimed at teenage boys didn't do that well in the um, in the box office this summer. Interesting. But, that's that's but, also interesting. Yes. Yeah. But movies like Oppenheimer made for adult audiences, the mature adult, they did well. And Barbie was made for girls and women and, you know, women who grew up who had Barbie. So, so the, when it comes to the entertainment industry, the industry is responsive to the audience and right now when there are so many different platforms and streamers and so many people able to create entertainment on their own they have to become much more responsible and they are becoming more responsible because everybody's chasing after the same audience and so they've got to build a better product because to capture that audience so i think they're being more consciously aware of of um, the audience and what needs to happen Let's say somebody calls you up, Marianne, and says, I need your help. I, I need to I, I need to change my attitude. I need to change my 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 trajectory and my career and my life because I feel like I'm getting old, but I know I have plenty of great years ahead of me. I want to be energetic. I want to work and I want to enjoy life. I want to travel. I want to skip around. And yeah, maybe I want to do a commercial or two. All right. Maybe, maybe nobody wants me to do one because I have a face for radio. But the, the point I'm trying to make is. What, what, what do you tell them? What, what's your, what's your first step? What do you, what, what's the first change you like a lot of these people to make? Okay. First, I'm going to start with you, Chris. Uh -oh. You just said I had a face for radio. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. You're I like my self-deprecating humor. <laughs> nah, nah, but you, the subconscious mind doesn't get the joke. I'm okay. telling you. So I have devised um, a snap out of it technique. And I'm writing a book, so have me back on when I finish the book. And we will. <laughs> but, but I will share share with your listeners right now. Um, it's snap out of it. S double S double N triple A triple P. So it's snap out of it. It starts with self love, self care. The N neuro linguistic programming, which is self talk. No, the power of no. Um, acceptance. Awareness, acceptance, appreciation, purpose, passion, and pride. Those 10 steps, and I will just tell you how to, how to begin with the first two. Self-love. When you get up in the morning and you're brushing your teeth and you're looking into the mirror, look into your eyes and tell yourself, I love you. You would say, I love you, Chris. I love you. Just say it 10 times. Or say as many times as it takes to brush your feet. Say it out loud. Say it to yourself. Just tell yourself, I love you. Look into your eyes. Your subconscious mind will get the message. The next is self-love. I mean, self-care. So often, especially for women, we just go through the day and we to, to get stuff done. We do whatever needs to be done. And we don't take the time to do something kind for ourselves. And the universe will treat us the way we treat ourselves. So make uh, and it set an intention to do something good for yourself that day, whether it's maybe it's to buy uh, a salad instead of a burger, even though the salad might cost a little more. Mm. Maybe it's taking setting 15 minutes aside to just meditate and chill and just just breathe in and breathe out and imagine the life that we, you want to have. But set the intention to do something positive for yourself because the whole day will go by and you will never have done it. And it becomes a habit. And once you set positive habits, then you're really on a roll. You don't even have to think about it anymore. Good, because I'm a positive guy. Anybody will tell you I'm a positive guy. 
I like balloons too, but that's a different story. Yeah. Okay. I, well, I had, I had some bubbles this weekend. I went to an outdoor concert. Ooh, I was going to blow some bubbles for you, but I, they're downstairs. Oh, sorry. Everybody loves bubbles. Oh man. <clears throat> now I got to blow some now after, after the show. Oh, well, <laughs> and balloon animals, but bubbles and balloon animals. I always love okay. those. But again, that's not, I, Again, that's a different story for a different time. Yeah, okay. we will definitely get you on for the book. But uh, how can people who are watching and listening to the program uh, learn more about you and uh, and your services, aging shamelessly, and and a lot more? Well, um, I would say connect with me on Instagram at Marianne Alda underscore aging shamelessly. If you Google me, all of this stuff will come up. If you can't remember the, and the it's two A's, text. two yes. A's and Alda. Yes. No relation to Alan. No relation to Alan. I always say Southern Italian. Um, and then go to my TED Talk. My TED Talk, and I've given it a URL. Ageism is a bully, TED.com. That's ageism spelled with an A-G-E-I-S-M. Ageism is a bully, TED.com. It's you know a short video, and it's very motivational. And I think everybody will get something out of it. You know, just, yeah, listen to the TED Talk. It's see, right on your website too, by the yes, way, in case and people see, are wondering. And, and see what resonates for you. And yeah, but if you don't want to go through the whole website, eh, you don't have to. <laughs> just go to the TED Talk. You can find it. Care. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I don't know. I don't need to do that. <laughs> I don't need to promote myself. I really want to. That's my job. That's my job. Yeah, doing but, that. Um, but I, if, that is my gift to people that I that I kind of have developed this philosophy of life and maybe you will have heard this, some things that you might've heard before, but it might resonate with you a little differently. So check out the TEDx talk and, you know, send it to your friends who you think might need to see, and need to hear it. And then right. wait for the book. Excellent. <laughs> Well, we're going to have you on when the book comes out. I want to thank you very much for being with me, uh, being with me here on the out to, uh, on the outhouse lounge, Marianne. Oh Thanks boy, for having I'm starting me. to forget things. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's a, and that you know, it happens. You know, like you you say we're having a senior moment. When were you in high school when you couldn't find? Remember where you put your keys? Were you having a sophomore moment? No, it just happens. You're being human, Chris. That's You're right. just being human. No, I'm being me. I'm always losing my keys or losing something here and there. Oh, Ooh. okay. Because you know why? <laughs> because you just told yourself, I'm always losing things. So you will. It's becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Just say, hmm, okay, here's a, a little another little takeaway. When you find yourself doing something like that, instead of saying, oh, I did it again, just say, look at it with curiosity. Hmm, that's curious. I can't find my keys again. I have to do better about that. Oh, I was thinking maybe go. I could say, can I do that? <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. That was bad. That okay. Was bad. Mary, I, 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 think, I think you have a, I think you've missed your calling. I think you should be doing stand-up, Chris. Oh, yeah. Well, right now okay. I'm doing some sit-down comedy, but I'd, okay. I've always wanted to be a stand-up comedian. Then no. do it. Do All it. Right. I, maybe I will give that a shot one day. I, I, I should. I tried that a couple times before, but... Uh, Apparently the 1990s and me doing stand-up comedy were not a good mix, but that's a different story for a different day. I wonder, okay. if, I, wonder if I'd be a mix for now. Oh my gosh. Try anyway. it. Try it. <laughs> I have Try to it. water you myself down like, heavily. Like, but listen, at the, I, I feel that disappointment about things not working out is a lot easier to live with than regret for not having tried. Sure. And if you get punched in the nose, you get up, dust yourself off, and there you go. go right at it again. Uh, that I, I definitely agree with, and I, I really thank you for coming on with us here, Marianne. It was fun talking TV with you. It was fun talking your career, and we didn't even get to the whole thing. We we're gonna have to do some of that with your book. So uh, okay. be ready to talk about working with uh, Ogre from Revenge of the Nerds on First and Ten. <laughs> okay. I loved him; he was great. But uh, <laughs> on the other hand, uh, once again, check out um, check out Marianne's website. That of course is. Uh, um, was it Marianne in her prime? Marianne, Marianne in her uh, prime her, dot yeah, com. Dot com. There yeah. we go. Marianne in her prime dot com. And the book's coming out soon. Marianne Alda, the age disruptor. And yes, check out clips of the royal family on YouTube because I was going through that uh, rabbit hole and it was a lot of fun. Marianne, again, thank you for being with me. And thank you all for joining us on the Outhouse Lounge. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody.